and welcome to our Zuma Scientist series. This series is sponsored by the Lake Champlain Sea Grant, UVM Extension, and SUNY Plattsburgh Education Program known as Watershed Alliance. Lake Champlain Sea Grant develops and shares science-based knowledge to benefit the environment and economies of the Lake Champlain Basin. As for the Watershed Alliance Program, it is a Lake Champlain Sea Grant education program that aims to reach K through 12 students and their teachers throughout the Lake Champlain Basin. Our goal is to increase awareness and knowledge of watershed issues in youth throughout Vermont and New York. Uh, the Zuma Scientist series was created in response to the current need for more virtual programs. So every Tuesday and Friday from now until the middle of June, we'll be hosting a guest scientist to tell us more about their research in the basin. Just as a heads up, this webinar is currently being live streamed to our YouTube channel and can also be found on our website. Um, that way, there is another avenue for teachers and students to view these presentations. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for today. So let's welcome our presenter, uh, Dr. Ellen Marsden. Ellen is a fish biologist, despite her career in biology studying bird migration and frogs, but that's another story. She's worked on lake trout in Lake Ontario as a graduate student in Corn at Cornell University and then studied fish and zebra mussels in Lake Michigan for several years. Ellen joined the University of Vermont in 1996 and has done research on lake trout, lake sea lamprey and invasive species in Lake Champlain since then. So today's topic um, is going to be water is an alien habitat for humans. Most information about fish is collected by remotely sampling, aka bringing fish to the surface to study them. How do scientists use these samples of fish to understand whether fish populations are healthy? Are they increasing or decreasing in abundance? How do we interpret that data from a few fish to understand the whole lake? What new methods are being developed for observing this fish? are these fish. So with that, Ellen, I'm actually gonna pass over the floor to you, and that way you get to introduce yourself as well as start your presentation. Okay. So you've released, you're gonna release your screen? Well, I think you can do it right over mine, but I can stop sharing too, but if you just press sh new share, you should be fine. Yeah, I can stop sharing my screen, there you go. And let's see if this works. Give me one moment. No worries. Now, so do you just see the slide? I don't see the slide quite yet. Yeah. Uh, now I see you're in presenter mode currently. Okay. So, uh, but we see all your slides, Ellen. Is there a way to zoom in just on your introduction slide? Right, so it's a matter of having too many screens. Okay, let's try this again. Single slide? That is a single slide, so if you just want to press the... Um, right now we see the whole... Uh, go back to what you had just done. I'm just going to flip. Yep, yep. I'm just going to have to flip screens. One second. Okay, no worries. Let's try this again. Thanks everybody for your patience. As always, we're learning with technology, um, but we'll be with you just shortly and hear what Professor Marzen has to say. No, it's still on the, oh, I see. You've still got too many slides. Right now, I just, I don't see anything. It just says Jay Marsden on your screen. So I think you have to go back into share screen mode. All right, and is there a way to press the, pres yep, down in the bottom. Um, hmm. It's showing all your slides, Ellen. It's refusing. Okay, let me try one more thing then. I'm going to pull everything down to one screen and see if that'll work. Okay. We're still sharing? Uh, it's a white blank screen for me right now. <laughs> Drat. Okay. <laughs> Interesting that it worked the first time. Let's it try did it. when we tested it out. Yeah, yeah. If I have to, I'll do it um, one slide at a time. Hmm. All right, let's try this again. All right.
What do you see? I see your screen, but I see the, the slides off to the side. I say, Ellen, we can run with this for right now, just for the, um, I think yeah. if you go to the, yeah, um, Nate or Ashley, do you have any tips on how Ellen can do the present mode? When she pressed the present mode beforehand, it showed everything. Ellen, are you on one screen now? I'm on two screens. Two screens. Um, try and press the presenter mode one more time. Okay, go back. Um, what we can do, Ellen, is you can run the, the presentation this way. Um, yeah, does that's this, fine. Is that okay? Yeah, it'll work for me. Okay, great. Yeah, it's just, uh, and I'll maximize it just a touch more. Okay. Uh, and that doesn't help. You've got the bottom. One more. Um, okay. So thanks for the introduction. Um, as uh, as Carolyn said, basically I'm a, I'm a fish biologist, or more technically, I'm a fisheries biologist, meaning I study fish for their own sake, but also because um, fisheries is is related to the intersection between people and fish. So. Uh, we use fish for a, a variety of things. Fish are important to us. So why do we want to know about fish? We could know about fish because they're just plain cool. Um, that upper right picture of an aquarium, they're gorgeous. They're interesting. They do unusual things. They're in a habitat that's alien to us and therefore fascinating. But we also like to eat them and we also like to catch them and we also like to play with them. And for all those reasons, we basically need to know that fish populations are healthy, they're abundant, we need to know mm, a bunch of details about them. Um, this is an image of a commercial fishery. So these are the fish that ultimately will end up on a plate somewhere. And those are really important globally because they're food but they're also economy. The people on this boat are working hard to make a living and the people who receive those fish are going to work hard to prepare them, to sell them, to put on people's plates. So there's a millions of dollars worth of economy that's related to commercial fishing. And to keep that commercial fishing going, we need to know that the fish populations are healthy. So, how do we find out whether fish populations are healthy? So that's what I'm going to talk about, trying to get into an alien environment that we can't breathe, that we most of the time we can't see into, and, and determine how the fish are doing. But let me, let me start with a question, just for fun, because I'm presuming people are on this webinar because you're either interested in fish, you know something about fish, maybe you don't know anything about fish, but want to find something out about them. So, okay, so we're going to talk about counting fish and, and why it's challenging, because a lot of scientists' time is dedicated towards simply counting fish. Awesome. So Ellen, I'm going to launch the poll right now with that oh. question, and I'll read right through it. So what makes counting fish so difficult? Is it A, because they're very slippery and hard to hold? B, some of them are very small and hard to identify? C, they live underwater? and are difficult to catch, or D, all of the above. So we'll give it maybe 30 seconds as people roll on in. Maybe about five more seconds. All right, I'm gonna end that poll and share the results. So Ellen, awesome. do you want to walk people through what they see? Uh, absolutely. So basically what we've got is 97% of you, 29 of you said all of the above. They're slippery, they're hard to hold, they're small, they're hard to identify, and they're hard to catch. Um, one person actually said uh, it's because they live underwater and are difficult to catch. So yeah, all of these things are both true and not true. They can be challenging to catch. And I'll talk about that a little bit. That's a little bit, you know, how do we find out uh, uh, where they are and how many there are? Um, some of them are very small, sure. The ones we eat tend to be bigger, hard to identify. Yeah, you've got to get some training. You've got to be a fish biologist or read some books or train yourself. That's an easy one to, to, to address. Um, slippery and hard to hold. Yeah, uh, not, a, not a major problem. Uh, there are, you know, one can learn how to handle fish. So definitely all of these um, um, pieces uh, uh, are involved in counting fish and I'll go through some of them. All right. And you're good to go, Ellen. Okay. Uh, and I still see that on my screen. Uh, okay, got it. I'll just take it away. All right. So 
whoops, no, there we go. So um, I just realized we're going to have a problem here because these slides won't work one at a time. I'm going to try something here. Okay, does that work? Does, can everybody see just the main slide? And you see a bunch of them at the bottom, but don't worry about it. I'm just going to focus on the main slide. Does that work? Yep, works for us. All right. So here is the problem with working with water is it is an alien medium. If I asked you how many fish are in that lake, this is it's Lake Placid actually, how would you know? We're just standing here looking at basically a blank surface. It's beautiful, but it's not an environment we can see into without some pretty significant technology. And there's a lovely quote by Charles Waterman that basically says, you know, most of the world is covered with water. It just happens to be a place that we can't see. So if you're going to be a fisherman or, or more politically correct, an angler, because most fishes, now, many fishes now are, are women as well, um, your job's simple. Just pick out the right places to put your net or your hook or your bait or whatever it is you're fishing with. Great, how do we know? So we have to figure out ways of getting below the surface and putting gear down that will allow us to somehow visualize fish. Now, that's a small lake. Um, I work on Lake Champlain and I know not all of you are from Lake Champlain. I think of it as a pretty small lake because we used to, I used to work in, in, in the Great Lakes. So Lake Champlain is only about 100 miles long and only about 15 miles wide. For some people, that's still pretty big. And so I'm going to spend a lot of my time referring to a lake that's sort of that middle-sized lake where we want to know how many fish are out there, right? Because we want to know what can we harvest. We want to harvest things like lake trout and whitefish and yellow perch and white perch and fish that are interesting to catch, interesting to eat if you want to take them home. And I, as a scientist, want to be able to tell you, are those fish populations healthy and do they have enough to eat? So are there enough fish that are prey for those most important fish, shall we say? And so when I refer to fish now, from now on, I'm going to just talk about fish in general, but frequently we're studying one species at a time. I study lake trout, but then I also study things like smelt, which is what the lake trout eat, so we know whether the lake trout have enough out there to eat. Now, when I was working on Lake Michigan and now in Lake Champlain, not infrequently I'll have somebody come up to me and say, so how many fish are there in Lake Champlain? And I'll go, oh, you mean species, right? Well, there are 72 species in Lake Champlain, plus 15 that have been introduced accidentally as invasive species. And the person I'm talking to will say, no, 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 no. No, I mean, how many fish are there in Lake Champlain? Uh, I have no idea. At which point they say, well, what kind of fish biologist are you? I mean, come on, really? Y you study fish. You should know how many fish there are in Lake Champlain. I have no idea. I mean, okay, how many trees are there in Mount Mansfield? That's a mountain uh, you know, in the Green Mountains, just, just east of me. Well, okay, given enough time, I presume you could go for a nice long walk for probably several weeks and tell me how many fish that, uh, uh, trees there are on, Ma uh, on, on Mount Mansfield. Um, a, a really cool colleague called John Shepherd um, basically says counting fish is just like counting trees. And what's the problem here? Um, except they're invisible and they keep moving around. And that's the problem, right? They're invisible and they keep moving around. But we live in a modern age where we've got technology. We could go look at them, right? We can do scuba, we can do snorkeling, we can get down there into the water. But counting fish one at a time, like this diver is doing, he's actually trying to count fish that live on the bottom, little tiny fish called sculpin, and he's gonna do it one at a time. That's going to take an awfully long time to count all of the fish in Lake Champlain, and he's only looking at one species. And it gets kind of cold down there, and you've got limited time underwater. All right, we got better technology than that. This is our University of Vermont research vessel, the Malasaira, uh, and there's a graduate student there dropping a robot into the water. This is what we call uh, an ROV. Many people, some of you in high school, might have built one of these. Um, a remotely operated vehicle with video, so it's a remote, remotely operated video. So we can drop this underwater. We don't have to spend as much time being cold and wet. Um, we can let the robot do the work for us and we'll get sort of cool pictures of fish. This is actually marine fish. You wouldn't find these in Lake Champlain. Uh, they're related to the Pompano. 
So now we can see them. All we just have to do is count them and they keep moving around. All right, so clearly that's not going to be the solution that's going to be pretty challenging. Well, there are ways of estimating the number of fish. Um, a classic one, and anybody who's taken fish biology, I know there's at least one of my students is on this call, I gather. Uh, you can do what's called mark and recapture. So you can catch some fish and treat them carefully so they stay healthy. You don't, you don't stress them too much. And you mark them. And this fish has a little mark. This is fish number 272. And you release that fish. So you mark a whole bunch of fish and you release them into the lake. You know how many you mark. They're each individually marked. And then you go out and catch a whole bunch more fish. And you look at the number of fish in the second sample that have your tags on them. And you take those two pieces of information. It's actually three pieces. How many did you mark? How many did you catch the second time? And what percentage of the ones you caught the second time have the mark? And then you can extrapolate from that small number that have the tags in the second uh, uh, capture effort, and you can extrapolate that to the entire population. So if you marked 100 fish and you pick up fish the second time and 10% of them have a mark, you can say, hmm, 10% of these are marked. We can extrapolate that to how many fish in the entire body of water there must be. Yeah, that works. But in a lake the size of Lake Champlain, you've got to mark a lot of fish. I mean, a lot of fish, because you need to be able to recapture about 10% of what you marked. So years ago, I did this in Lake Michigan. We said, oh, let's estimate how many fish there are, uh, excuse me, how many yellow perch there are in Lake Michigan. We spent three years, we marked 55,000 yellow perch. And then we spent another three years recatching yellow perch to see how many were marked. We recaught about 1% of the ones that we'd tagged. And we came up with an estimate of how many yellow perch there were in Lake Michigan of about 13 million. Plus or minus, this is a way of estimating how good our, uh, getting an idea of how good our estimate is. So 13 million plus or minus about 15 million, which means we really have no idea because our range of estimates includes zero. So 13 million minus 15 million is less than zero. We really couldn't do it. The lake's too big, there's too many fish, it's too challenging to mark and recapture enough of them. Okay, we got to find a better way to do it than that. So let's go out. This is Lake Champlain. We've got a trawl behind the boat. This is a graduate student, Peter Euclid. The trawl's coming in. This trawl has been dragged on the bottom of the lake for about 10 minutes. Um, this is one of very, very many ways of catching fish. So we're out here trying to catch small fish, in this case, the kind of fish that, that larger fish are going to eat. We're going to catch smelt, alewife, trout perch, sculpin, things like that. We bring the net up on deck, we empty it into a fish tote or a fish box, uh, which is the green thing you're seeing, and we dump them out on a table and we start counting. And we count and we count and we count. We identify, um, we all know at this point we've had some training, we know what species of fish is which. On that desk, uh, on that table, mostly they're smelt, there's some alewife. In the bucket on the left, we've got some lake trout, and then there's going to be a bunch of even smaller fish in among the big ones. All right, so we got a bunch of fish. So here's Lake Champlain. I've got a piece of Lake Champlain there, about 90 miles worth of it. We've taken our little sample there off Burlington, that little red dot in the center of the lake. Cool, we've done a trawl and we got 2,453 fish. Excellent. Ah, so what does that mean? That's one sample of fish. Um, is that a good sample? Or what, what if we do it again? Will we always get 2,453 fish? Mm, obviously not. And that has to partly do with how we took the sample and also got to do with the just general fun, uh, variability in, in the world. All right, so let's try it again. Now we've got four samples, four different trawls done for 10 minutes in the same place. And we've got lots of different estimates. So we've got an estimate of 2,400. 1700, 2900, and so forth. All right, if we take all of those together, we can get an average. So we can average about 2700 fish, and we can get a variability. So um, in statistics, this is called a standard deviation. Fancy word that just means it's a way of estimating how good our average is. So our average on the whole, taken across all of our 
uh, all of our samples can be summarized as being plus or minus uh, 530. So we've really got somewhere between about 2200 and about 3200 fish ish. So we, we're beginning to get an estimate of fish are uh, in that location. Hmm, all right. This is a better estimate, but it depends on the assumption that we're taking all the si samples the same way, meaning with the same gear, a trawl, the same kind of trawl, put off the boat the same way for the same amount of time, and time in this case is effort, a 10 minute trawl, a 10 minute sample. If we do everything the same way each time, then we've got what we call a catch per unit effort. For a 10 minute trawl, in the first one we got 2,453, the second one we got 1,697, and so forth. We've got a CPUE. And so our estimates are good with respect to each other. That first trawl was done exactly the same way as the last trawl, and we can average them all together, and that's great. But that's only one little tiny point in Lake Champlain. That's not much information. We repeated it to get a sense of how reliable that particular point is, but we should really look at a little bit more of the lake. So let's do it again and again. And let's start covering more of the lake. Now, you can already begin to see that this is a lot of effort, right? Every one of those points means two or three hours of uh, time getting to the site, of uh, some time getting the troll out, bringing it back in again, counting the fish, getting to the next site, and we do it all over again. So there we go. So we've done that. We've got lots of samples, lots of numbers. Um, we've repeated trolls probably at every one of those dots. Now, how many fish are there in Lake Champlain? I have no idea. <laughs> we've just done a huge amount of work, and all I can tell you is that how many fish there are in each one of those trolls in each one of those places. Oh, there were more than last year. Cool. It really doesn't get us anywhere near the question of how many fish there are in Lake Champlain. It only gets us relative to something else. And here's the awful secret about fisheries biologists. We'll never be able to tell you how many fish there are unless we do something very drastic like kill all the fish in a small body of water and count every single one of them, at which point I'll guarantee there are no more fish because we just killed them all. Or we use very hard methods like mark and recapture, which will still be an estimate, but it might begin to estimate how many fish there are, again, in a fairly small body of water. We can't do it in a body of water as large as something like Lake Champlain, Lake Michigan, or the oceans. But what we can do is do it over time. So if we do the same method in the same places for the same amount of time, so those trawls, the same kind of trawl, the same boat, 10 minutes per trawl, and we do it repeatedly over time, we get something that is almost more useful than knowing how many fish there are every year, which is relatively how much is the population changing over time. So this is one particular population of fish in Lake Champlain, and we're basically saying, Hmm. All right, so in 1984, there were a whole lot of them. There were a lot more the next year, four times the next year, uh, four times as many. And then it dropped and then it went back up again. Okay, wow, that's, that's going to be really hard to deal with. It's up and it's down, it's up and it's down. But after hmm, 30 years, we get to see a picture about what's happening to that particular population. There was a year around 2004 where there were a lot of smelt. It smelt, by the way, in this lake. But that was a blip. By and large, we could draw a straight line through that population of fish and going, hmm, this population's actually, from a scientific standpoint, fairly stable. Sometimes it goes down, sometimes it goes up. But there's nothing there to panic us. This population is not declining and it's not going out of control. It's just doodling along, going up and down. Realizing that every point, every year on that graph is an estimate. It's not an exact count of the fish. It's an estimate from several trolls, several samples. There'll be variability around that estimate. We can't be absolutely certain that we've got each dot correct. But over time, we can be fairly reassured that population stable. Great. 
it's relative and that's what we do in fisheries biologists but it's a lot of effort my crew get tired it gets cold we're out there when it's snowing we're out there when it's the blazing sun and we're killing a lot of fish to get those numbers because we can't just catch 20 fish and say, oh, yeah, 20 fish, right? We'll use that as our estimate. We need to have a few hundred thousand fish to be sure that we're getting fairly good estimates. This is a rough way to do it for the crew. It's a rough, rough way to do it for the fish. While they're out there on the back deck counting fish, inside the cabin, we've got what every angler, every boater has, which is a sonar. It's something that's transmitting sound to the bottom of the lake. It's bouncing off the bottom, coming back up to the boat. It's being recorded by some high technology saying, this is how deep the water is that you're in. So sonar was designed basically to say, is it getting shallow? Are you gonna hit the bottom? Are you in deep water? Where are you? But while we developed sonar, and this is over the last 70 years or so, People noticed that there were echoes above the bottom. So if you could see my uh, uh, mouse here, that red line along the middle of the screen says that's where the bottom is. It's at 49.3 meters in my case, because the sonar's in meters. But there's all that fluff, all that stuff above the red line. That's fish. Oh, hey, that's fish. If I'm an angler, that tells me I can go catch fish. That's great. If I'm running a trawl, that tells me I could drop the trawl, I'll probably get fish. But wait a minute, if I can see them on the sonar, why don't I just count them on the sonar? Why would I put a net out there and go kill a bunch of fish and make a lot of hard work for my crew about on the back deck counting them when we could do it much more technologically? And so over the last 30 or 40 years, we've refined sonar, the kind of fish finder that anglers use that say, oh, wow, there's fish on the bottom and made it much more accurate. And this is what we call hydroacoustics. Hydroacoustics is glorified sonar. We've got, a, what we're looking at here is a boat track. We're going from left to right. The boat's been moving over the bottom of the lake. We've got lots of little echoes. Now they're much more discreet than you saw on that kind of blur on the fish finder on, on the ship, the normal sonar. Each one of those dots now is a fish and all that blur up above is plankton, a little tiny echoes that are very, very dense at the top of the lake where the, the photosynthesis is occurring and there's lots of zooplankton and the fish are eating that, but the big fish are down at the bottom in this part particular case. So the configuration will change between the day and the night and where you are in the lake. But now this is all on a computer and the computer is going to count all those little dots for us. And I don't need to get into all the horrific details of what it looks like trying to count all those little dots by computer, but suffice it to say that we've not only got dots, but we've got sizes of dots. And that's partly reflected into the color of these little dots. And so the computer will, at the end of a little bit of analysis, tell us, oh, you've, over the space of where you've just been looking, you've got 563,000 this kind of dots, which we think are probably this species based on their configuration, and you've got 620,000 of this kind of fish and so forth. We've got a huge amount of data. And the point is that we can start in Lake Champlain and we can run all the way down the lake in a night or a day, in a few hours, collecting data every second of the way. That's a lot of information. And, you know, guess what? We never killed any fish. We just looked at them from afar using sonar and we counted them. Frankly, this is a lot better way to count fish. Um, doesn't hurt the fish. It doesn't take us as much time. We count a lot more fish. We can repeat it and get another estimate. We can go back up the lake along that trawl track again. We can do it in any part of the lake and we get huge numbers. Um, now, to be fair, we don't know anything about those individual fish because we never touched them. So we're going to have to, and, and by the way, and we've still only looked at a tiny portion of the lake. It's still an estimate, right? So every now and again, we're going to have to drop a trawl or some other kind of net and pick up some of those fish that were counted by sonar and take a look at them and say, mm, okay, what are you in fact? 
Those little dots, oh, they are smelt. The bigger dots, oh, they are lake trout. Those really big dots that we saw occasionally, maybe that's a sturgeon. And then we'll use those numbers to extrapolate to the rest of that 2,798,000 fish that we estimated from the sonar. And from those few fish that we caught in the trawl, we'll get what we call biological data. We'll get things like, are they male? Are they female? How old are they? Do any of them have parasites? What's in their diets? All that other information we need to know how fish, um, how healthy the fish are. And briefly then, um, we need to do it again every year so we can follow fish populations over time. Somebody's gonna ask, uh, but this is not a polled question yet. I'll get to that in just a moment. Can we extrapolate those estimates to the rest of the lake? We just sampled a really big transect, a very big line through the lake, 2,798,000 fish. Couldn't we just say, we sampled this much area, couldn't we just multiply by the total area of the lake? And that's a really challenging question. And briefly, not really, because those fish don't live in equal likelihood in all parts of the lake we would have to extrapolate only to the parts of the lake that those particular species of fishes want to be in. The deep parts, the shallow parts, the warm parts, the cold parts, that's challenging. Okay, that's, a, that's another whole talk at some point. So we need to handle the fish to get full amount of information or we need to take photographs of them to know who they are. We need to combine technologies and hands-on stuff and remote technologies to get a full, picture of what's happening. For example, this is a bunch of lake trout. We know the lake trout because as a fisheries biologist, fish biologist, we can identify them as such. And if we look really closely, we can also see that some of them have lamprey wounds on them. And that tells us this population mm, has got some problems. Um, some of them are looking a little ragged. These are fish on a spawning site and they're getting a little old and they're not as healthy as they could be. So there's a role for lots of different types of biology to make these estimates that we're, we're working on to determine how healthy a fish population is. All right, I'm going to change gears um, and just totally change for a second and ask another poll question, which is, what's your favorite place to look for fish? Given that I've told you various ways to look for them, do you rather go to Echo where it's nice and warm and comfortable, look in an aquarium, look on a dinner plate because you don't really like the fish themselves, but they taste great. Do you like going out to streams or do you like just going out to a lake, looking off a dock perhaps, or a boat and seeing what you got? All right, they're rolling in. We'll give it another 10-ish seconds. Looks like some people are changing their answers. I love it. You know, I don't know which one to pick. <laughs> Can I pick them all, please? <laughs> all right, I'm gonna end that poll and share the results. Cool. So the most people are like looking down into the water from a boat. And I'm going to guess part of that's because I get to be on a boat as well. And there's just, it's delightful because although maybe you're not in the water and you might want to be on a hot day, just watching what's happening below you is, is fascinating. Streams get the second vote, same thing, but an easier to access habitat. You don't need a boat. An aquarium, surprisingly few of you are eating fish. Um, Perhaps a little hard to enjoy watching fish swimming around and then putting it on a killing it, putting it on a plate and eating it. Um, but of course, in fisheries, that's partly what's involved in studying fish is studying them so that they can, in fact, provide food for various populations. So um, that's as much as I have for a formal presentation, but I would love to open it up to any kinds of questions any of you have. Um, Carolyn, I'm going to stop sharing here so yep. that I can look at uh, look at chat as it comes in, and I will let you uh, yep, navigate. And, and, and I'll facilitate yeah. those questions as well. I'll start sharing my screen. Give me just a second. The PowerPoint should be pulled up. All right, everybody. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, if you have any questions, this is a great time for you to put it in that Q&A section. And maybe Ellen, as we have questions coming in right now, we've kind of been starting with each of our presenters. Would you mind just telling us a little bit about how you ended up in the field that you are today, the position that you are, kind of the path that you got for those of, you know, that aren't quite sure of career paths or don't even know that things exist? 
how'd you get to where you are? Um, I wanted to be a vet. Um, <laughs> and then I got really interested in bats and then I did research on birds. I, I had some very, it's a, it's a long story, <laughs> but at some point a, a faculty member at Cornell where I was doing my graduate work said, I need a graduate student to study fish. And I said, ew, I don't like fish, but can I scuba dive? And he said, okay, if you must. Um, and I just got really entranced with how incredibly interesting fish were. I would have been very happy studying birds or bats or frogs, but it ended up being fish and uh, I never looked back and I'm having a great time studying fish. Awesome, I love it. Um, so again, feel free to throw those questions into the question and answer for um, our presenter. Nate, I'm going to ask for your help. For some reason, when I'm clicking Q&A right now, it's just not popping up on my screen since probably since I'm in present mode. So would you be willing to read some questions out loud for Ellen? And yeah. I can see them, by the way. Yep. Okay, nice. No worries. I'm happy to, to facilitate our question and answer. Um, thanks a lot, Ellen. That was, that was a brilliant presentation. Um, really appreciate it. So. Uh, there's a question from Tate uh, asking about the possibility of catching the same fish over and over in different points when you're sampling. Um, so I think this came from the earlier point of the presentation where perhaps you were tagging and releasing um, or trawling and then, uh, you know, bouncing around to different points on the lake to get an estimate of fish counts. That's a it's an excellent question um, because that is one of the big problems with the mark and recapture. It's not a problem because each mark has an individual number on it, so we know. Oh, we caught that one again. Oh, and we caught it again, and you put that into the numbers. Um, with the trawling, unfortunately, mm, the fish don't live through it, and that's why it's really tough. So, having sampled them, they've just been taken out of the population. Every technique is different. The hydroacoustics you could double count fish and that we just have to take that into account in the analysis, estimate double counting and, and work with it numerically. Great, uh, thanks for that. I think it's <laughs> it's always interesting to think about the, the number of different ways you can collect fish on Lake Champlain or, or in any lake for that matter, right? And you went through a few of those, but you start to wade in the, okay, well, what's, what's the margin of error? Am I catching the same fish over and over again? And then impact, am I, you know, killing these fish by handling and, and, and counting them? And is that, you know, counteracting my ultimate, ultimate mission, right? Of like gaining knowledge for the sake of conservation or whatever your goal is. So it's interesting to think through all of these uh, ramifications, which absolutely I presentation. Um, another question from Holly uh, in regards to climate change. So, uh, how, what do you do with all of this data to add to the worldwide effort to fight climate change? So I don't know if you've thought through, uh, I'm sure you have at various points, sort of your research or other fisheries biologists work on, on the lake um, and how some of this data on fish populations might um, offer clues or sort of a, a data point um, in, in efforts to combat the effects of climate change. So yeah, the burning question for all of us, and I, I wouldn't say we're combating it. It'd be nice to feel like we could do something useful to make a difference. But what we are doing is documenting things like what does climate change mean for a resource as important as fish and fisheries? Because a very considerable portion of the world depends on fish as a considerable part of their diet or their livelihood or both. So fish as a whole are extremely important um, and, and, and fish are being affected by climate change. Even though they're underwater, water warms up. There are places, particularly in lakes, where the water gets too warm and some fish populations are suffering. So it's contributing to that knowledge base of what the impacts of climate change are that uh, is, is the role of fisheries biologists. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's always a difficult thing, right? We all want to be doing everything we can in the face of huge complex problems such as climate change, but certainly documenting species, uh, hopefully prior to the change or their persistence throughout uh, adversity and changing climate uh, is, a, is a really important step, right? If we don't have that, that benchmark, we can't accurately assess, as you said, the, the shifts in populations um, or whatever might happen. Um, so thank you for that. Another 
question coming in about uh, predator prey relationships. So specifically, if the bait fish population goes up, would then the predator fish population go up as well? So if you want to talk through a little bit of uh, predator prey relations as it pertains to, to fish. Right. Once, once again, excellent questions. I love these. Um, yes, there's always a balance between the predator and the prey populations. So um, it's not an immediate response. So if there's suddenly lots of smelt or lots of alewife, then the predators that are eating them will be healthier. They can reproduce more. There'll be a lot more baby predators. And so the predator population goes up. And then, of course, you worry about the reverse happening. Now we have excess, lots of predators, and do they eat too many prey? The prey population drops. Usually what happens is an equilibrium between the two. So they stay in balance with each other. If the prey population starts getting too low, the fish population can't reproduce as well. And so there'll be fewer predators and they just fluctuate around uh, some sort of happy mean. It will go up, it will go down, um, but they do respond to each other, yes. Yeah, that, that's great. And again, you know, that's the importance of fisheries biology, right, is tracking those yeah. fluctuations. And so you can get an idea of the trend rather than just maybe marking one low point or one high point and, and you get that sort of uh, arc over many years or, or decades even. And, and I'll, I'll add briefly that, that when it gets scary is when we start to impose changes on the lake. So a lot of our predators in Lake Champlain, for those of you who are local here, and, and this is true in a lot of lakes, including the Great Lakes, a lot of them are stopped. Um, so, so we decide, uh, wow, wouldn't it be fun to have some Pacific Northwest salmon in Lake Champlain? So we stock them here, rainbow trout, um, brown trout from Germany, or we've affected a population so severely that we need to stock them to make the population healthy again or bring them back into a lake. And that's a little scary because we're stocking predators. And so what we have to do as fisheries biologists is make certain that we know what's happening to their prey because we could easily accidentally overstock predators and now it's no longer um, a balance between predator and prey responding to each other because it's basically the prey responding to what the humans are doing with the predators. It gets complicated very quickly when we're starting to manage a lake, especially when we start doing that kind of um, hands-on effect of how many fish are in the lake. Yeah, I think that's a, a really key point to, to highlight. So thank you for that. Um, Another question from uh, Wanda, very general, and I'm interested to see uh, where you take this and your answer to this. Uh, <laughs> wondering about the health of Lake Champlain fisheries, and I'll, I'll let you uh, take that in any direction um, you want. So what is the health of Lake Champlain fisheries? Where, where do you think we're at? Uh, Right. And, and it can go many ways. And of course, um, um, Wanda has said fisheries, so I'll take it that way. Um, because we could say, what is the health of the Lake Champlain fish? And that would be more individually about, do they have diseases? Are they eating well? You know, are the fish themselves healthy in that, that sense of the word? And by and large, the answer to that question, that question is, yes, they're doing great. Fisheries says, how good is the fishing out there? Um, are there enough fish? Are the population stable? Um, can we expect to still catch Atlantic salmon next year and the year after, et cetera? Um, a little bit of it is perspective. I came from the Great Lakes where some of the populations of fish are in big trouble because they have been over harvested or there are exotic species and those are damaging fish populations. We certainly have problems. Uh, things like lake sturgeon, which are not part of a fishery, we don't harvest them, but lake sturgeon are still recovering from a century of um, both overfishing uh, and then habitat damage and damming of lakes uh, of rivers where they spawn and they're in big trouble but they're slowly coming back overall if i were to take lake champlain as a whole and all the fish populations in it we're actually in pretty good shape um, there are some stressed fish like like lake sturgeon um, lake trout we're starting to recover them from having completely eliminated from eliminated them from the lake in, in 1900. We're starting to get uh, Atlantic salmon back from having wiped them out in the 1800s. Um, so things, things are looking good. Um, the biggest problem probably is we have too many exotic species that keep 
uh, upsetting you know um, the balance of things and more exotic species are coming in so th that's a major stressor both for the lake and the biologists trying to study the lake yeah that's that's great um, thank you for that Ellen I think we have time for maybe one more question uh, and this is a quick one so maybe we'll try to tack on another one after this but a uh, question from Sandy uh, which fish is the most predominant species in Lake Champlain? So what species is the most abundant, do you think? So, so most abundant, I mean, I, you know, predominant could be taken, you know, which is the sexiest species that everybody pays attention to, <laughs> that would be Atlantic salmon. Um, but predominant, you're talking numbers. And, and again, how many fish are there in Lake Champlain? Um, as with any kind of ecosystem, whether it's terrestrial or it's aquatic, the most abundant fish species are the ones lowest on the food web. And it's probably rainbow smelt, um, which eat plankton. So they're, they're eating the smallest part of the food web um, and they're feeding everything else further up, whether that's salmon or trout or walleye or what have you. But uh, yeah, I'd guess rainbow smelt. Ah, nice. I, I'm wishing I would have gone out on a limb because I thought that's what you were gonna say. <laughs> All right then, good. <laughs> um, Okay, we'll, we'll do one more quick question and then we'll turn it back over to, to Caroline to wrap up uh, and do the, do the feedback poll and provide you all with a take home activity. So uh, one more from uh, Mara about the forms of counting fish that you spoke about. Uh, we're wondering if these forms of counting fish apply to oceans and larger bodies of water. You sort of alluded to you know, the different sizes of bodies of water that you're trying to count fish in at the beginning of your presentation. Um, I'm, I'm curious about this too, if folks are trying to do this uh, you know, ocean wide or, or sea wide perhaps, or, or regionally in the ocean uh, in those larger bodies of water and trying to use um, sonar or other methods to, to try to quantify uh, different fish species. Once, once again, great questions. And, and the answer, the simple answer is yes, absolutely. Um, um, the oceans are, of course, the biggest fisheries, both in terms of the space, but in terms of the fish in them. They feed a third of the world with fish uh, in terms of the protein intake. Um, and these techniques are quite often developed in marine water, in salt water, uh, and, and then they're translated to large lakes like the Great Lakes or the, the Rift Lakes in Africa, for example, and then they slowly trickle down to smaller places like Lake Champlain or smaller ponds. But yep, um, NOAA in, in the US, and NOAA is the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, um, and under NOAA, the National Marine Fisheries Service um, does this kind of sampling uh, off, in the offshore and nearshore waters of, of the United States and basically translates exactly from what I've just been telling you, except it's a lot bigger and it takes a lot more time, a lot more fish and a lot more people and a lot more computing. Awesome. Uh, thank you for that. Maybe Caroline, I'll uh, ask you to, to join back in here and we can um, move ahead to the feedback poll and take home activity. And um, maybe if there's a little bit of extra time before one o'clock, we can cover a couple more questions. But before everyone gets out of here, maybe we should do the, the feedback poll. Yeah, completely agree. So I've got the slide back uh, on. So um, Nate's gonna quickly launch a feedback poll. Um, so that's, that should be popping up on your screen in the not too distant um, future. Uh, and while he's launching that, I'm just going to roll on to the next slide. Maybe you can multitask or I'll give you a couple of seconds to do the feedback poll. Um, it's a great way for us to just figure out how things are going. You know, we're almost halfway, if not past the halfway point of our um, Zuma Scientist series, but still always, always learning as we go. So feedback is great. Um, but once you finish that out, um, Ellen has designed a, a take home activity for you all. Just like she said, you know, it's hard to estimate fish numbers or do you ever want to know how many M&Ms are in a, in a big old bag? And so there's a way that you can do this. Um, and uh, in this link right here, and they will also put it into the chat box right now. It's just a, a link to a Google document because there were some more specific instructions, but it really is going to be with find something that you can count at least a hundred of something. So is that beans? Is that M&Ms? Is that pieces of corn? Whatever it may be, you're going to dump those out and you're going to put them flat on the surface and you're going to try and do your best estimate of splitting them in half. 
splitting them in half again until you have kind of eight roughly the same size groups and there's more instructions on how this applies to counting fish. Is there anything else, Ellen, that you'd like to add to kind of that exercise or tips or tricks? Um, basically, what it is, is a way of simulating what we do on the deck. Um, depending on how many fish we get in a trawl, sometimes there's enough to count, there's maybe three or four or 500. And sometimes we're just looking at this table of fish and thinking, oh my God, this is gonna take us all day. We cannot count them all. So basically what we'll do is what this exercise shows you. We split them in half and we look and say, yep, that looks like a good half and half. All right, split them in quarter and so forth. And then we count subsets of them. And so we're extrapolating from those sub samples to the whole sample similar to the way that ultimately we're going to be extrapolating from the subsample to what's happening in a broader area of the lake. Awesome. That's great. Thanks for thanks for sharing. I haven't done that activity myself, but I know some coworkers have, so I'll, I'll have to test that out. I've got plenty of beans in the house currently. Oh, um, M&Ms are more fun. Uh, definitely more fun. I'll have to invest in those as well. All right, for those of you still around, just letting you know what's happening next. So our next Zuma Scientist series is going to be this coming Friday. Um, and let me just find the description. I've got too many things popped up on my computer, so I wanna make sure I'm reading the right one. It says, the recent surge in natural reproduction by lake trout is a success story, but can too much success be a bad thing? Our research is exploring the interactions of lake trout, natural reproduction, and lake trout stocking strategies to evaluate if too many lake trout mouths will be too much for prey fish populations, especially in light of the potential for a quagga mussel invasion, which may shunt food, web, energy, and production to the bottom of the lake. So uh, definitely tying in with some of the things that Ellen just talked about with populations and how to measure. And so uh, don't forget to register online by going to our website. Uh, each time there's gonna be a new link, so make sure that you register. And if you know anybody that missed this current presentation, feel free to send them to our YouTube channel. Um, that way they can watch either this presentation a little bit later or any of the other ones that we've done so far. So we're hitting the one o'clock uh, mark right now. I'm looking how many participants are still on and if we wanna try and answer questions. We've got about 21 people. Maybe Nate, again, I still for some reason can't see questions. Uh, is there a way we can do maybe one more just based on timing earlier on? Sure, why not? Uh, Ellen, if you'd be willing, I'll uh, okay. throw one more question, your one or two more questions your way before we uh, log off here. Um, so we have a question here from John about the impacts of, of climate change again. And um, so what have you read in the literature or studies you, you know about um, in terms of climate change impacts on uh, freshwater fish populations in recent years, maybe the past 10 or 15 years or so? And then uh, again, uh, shifting native ranges in response to temperature changes um, among perhaps saltwater fish as well. Um, if you'd be willing to speak to, to anything in that in that realm. Um, certainly. So, so water has a high what we call thermal mass, meaning it, 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 um, it changes temperature slowly both warming up and cooling down. So the more water you have, the less likely it is for there to be a radical change in its temperature. Um, so small bodies of water are the hardest to, to or, or the ones that are most vulnerable to global climate change. Think about Shelburne Pond, right? It's gonna warm up really fast. Warm water fish makes them happier. Their range actually expands. Whereas a cold water fish like a lake trout or Atlantic salmon or something like that is going to suffer. Now, there aren't cold water fish in Shelburne Pond, it's too warm, but their ranges start to decrease. And yes, we are seeing that occurring in various parts of the world, let alone the US or even Vermont. And streams, of course, even more so. Streams become warm, less brook trout, or the brook trout's range decreases, or they get very stressed in summer and more of them die. So more of those effects in fresh water than we'll see in oceans that are just buffered by how huge they are. Brilliant. Um, thanks for that. I know it, it's 
it can be pretty complex when we're talking about, you know, different regions, different effects uh, of climate change on, on, you know, a number of different species. But I think you did well there in, in summarizing sort of the general effects um, we see and, and camping them sort of in, you know, cold water and warm water fishes and, and range expansion. Um, so I appreciate, I appreciate that. Um, another least, question about, oh, go ahead, Caroline. <laughs> Yeah, no worries. I was going to say I exited out of present mode so I can do the, the questions and just, Ellen, I think the last one, there's two questions that kind of tie in and maybe that was going to be what Nate said anyways. Um, do you want to talk about just a little bit about why trawling kills fish, you know, barrow trauma and define that term? Sure. Uh, and I've got three questions there and a couple of them I can answer very, very quickly. But Kim's question about why does trawling kill all the fish? Um, it, it's partly physical. You're dragging a, let, a, a net along the bottom. The fish gets you know, pulled into the net or, or the net pulls around the fish and then they get bumped around on the bottom and, and, and that stress is going to kill them. Also, if you drag them up from the bottom to the surface very quickly, they have an air-filled gas bladder, that's what you were talking about, and that expands as the pressure of the water releases closer to the surface. Um, um, there's a lot of pressure down deep and as that gas bladder expands, that kills the fish. It's basically like having a balloon uh, inflate inside their body and that's very painful and it kills them. So um, we can keep fish alive in a trawl. Uh, it just, we have to do things a little differently and some fish are more resilient to that damage. Sturgeon don't seem to care. Um, they, they come out of the trawl and they go, hi, could I, could you just put me back please? And, and you release them and they're fine. So it depends very much on how long the trawl's in and how deep you were and which species, etc. So that, that addresses Ben's question, have any fish survived the trawling? If we're careful with the right species, we can, we try and keep fish alive as much as possible. Sometimes we just have to say that's not going to be possible. Um, Somebody anonymous said, uh, do we count species other than fish? We count everything. Um, um, every piece of information we can get while we do this work, we collect it. And at some point, hopefully it's gonna be useful for something. So if we're looking at lake trout, we're gonna count every other kind of fish. If we get something that isn't the fish, which is rare in a trawl, we will obviously note that down as well. Great. All right, Ellen, well, I think we're going to wrap it up on that note. So thanks, everybody, for, for sticking around the last couple of minutes. And of course, we'll do a virtual round of applause. Um, thank you for teaching us about how to estimate fish populations, kind of what's happening in Lake Champlain. It's really tying in nicely with all of our other pre presentations. Um, and your graduate and PhD students have also presented and done phenomenal jobs as well. So that, that reflects wonderfully on, on you as their professor as well and as their advisor. So with that, thank you, everybody, um, and join us on Friday and for future ones.